This is a CBC Original Podcast. On December 31st, 1997, at a New Year's Eve party, Cheryl Shepard was proposed to on live TV. Two days later, she disappeared and was never seen again. Host David Richin heads to Hamilton, Ontario to investigate the case. Someone Knows Something, Season 2. Subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. All I do know is that nobody was ever charged. Alberta didn't just go missing. She didn't just go missing and she didn't just walk away. She knew the person, she trusted the person. Do you still feel like people are afraid? Probably, you know, it's been really hard because some of our immediate family members were a person of interest and suspects in uh, uh, being involved with Alberta that night. Were you afraid to go to the police? Yeah, I just had to be quiet. And I was like, oh my God, what have I done here? We really just want to get your side of the story. We're doing the story about Alberta and we really want to hear from you about her last night. Can you tell us anything about it? Was she at your house? I'm Connie Walker and this is Missing and Murdered, Who Killed Alberta Williams? A podcast and CBC News investigation. There's a small detail in Gary's notebooks that I find myself coming back to again and again. It's not particularly relevant to our investigation, and it's not the most haunting thing I've read in there, but for some reason, I can't get it out of my mind. It's a short little note entered right after Alberta's body is found, when police are examining the scene. It says, necklace with pendant around neck seized, was intact. And after the word pendant in parentheses is a name, Dave. So Alberta was wearing a Dave necklace when she was killed. And the fact that it was intact when police found her body was worth noting in Gary's notebook. You're probably wondering, Who is Dave? Well, Dave was Alberta's boyfriend. We haven't talked about him yet because he's not really part of our investigation. He lived in Vancouver at the time. And well, technically, they both did. After working in Prince Rupert for the summer, Alberta was supposed to head back to Vancouver to be reunited with Dave. Her best friend Geraldine told us that Alberta was in love with Dave. She wanted to marry him and was excited to be going back to see him. She found someone, somebody loves her, somebody cares for her, enough to marry her, do things with her. You could tell when she was in Rupert, she was happy. We got in touch with Dave. He's married now, with a family of his own. He didn't want to be interviewed for the podcast, but he remembers Alberta. And he sent us a photo of her that he's kept after all these years. The photo screams the 80s when you see it. Even though it's indoors, Alberta is wearing those big, dark, tinted sunglasses that all of my aunties had in the 80s. She looks like she's ready for a night out. Her hair is curled, she's wearing dangly earrings, and is dressed in all black. Her hands are stuffed in her short black leather jacket. Probably the same one she took to Prince Rupert that summer. And around her neck is a thin, delicate gold necklace. If you zoom in enough, you can see it says Dave. I can't stop thinking about Alberta and her Dave necklace and wondering what might have been. Over the past several months and the past seven episodes, we've uncovered a lot about Alberta's story. Through interviews with several of Alberta's family and friends, we felt like we got to know her a little bit. Almost everyone we talked to described Alberta as nice. And I guess that's not surprising, given our tendency to idealize people after they're gone. People also described her as gentle and shy, a good person. And her close friends talked about how she liked to laugh, how she liked to party, and how she was only shy until you got to know her. 
Alberta's sister, Claudia, shared a VHS tape with us. It's the only video she has of her sister. It was taken at a New Year's Eve party, just months before Alberta disappeared. It's a house party, and Alberta is there with her boyfriend, Dave. The picture is pretty fuzzy and the music is blasting, so I can't really hear what Alberta is talking about, but just watching her move around the room, talking to different people, helped me see her more outgoing side that people had described. At one point in the video, she's sitting on a couch talking to two people. I can't really see who they are. They're turned toward Alberta and she's facing the camera. She's more animated than I would have imagined. She's telling a story or something, and her head bobs up and down as she talks. Occasionally, she reaches over to touch the person next to her, like she's saying something really important or interesting and wants to make sure they're paying attention. I can't see what she's saying, but she looks like she's smiling and having fun. She's wearing a white shirt, and around her neck is a gold necklace that glitters as she moves. I can't tell for sure, but it looks like it's her Dave necklace. Our goal in this podcast was to help tell Alberta's story, not only focusing on the violence that resulted in her death, but we wanted to help listeners understand who she was, show how much she was loved, and how her unsolved murder still haunts her family and her community even 27 years later. We also wanted to try to find out the truth about what happened to Alberta. We spoke to dozens of people, including many who were there at the bar the night she supposedly disappeared. There was just the one table with the three girls, Jack and Gordon, when I got there, because I got off of work. How was Alberta that night? How was she doing? Good, she was having a good time. She was having a good time. And she was laughing so hard, you know, I was looking... She looked like she was troubled. I was asking her what was going on, and she wouldn't tell me. I was wondering what was what was troubling her, but she, she talked to the, to the girl. She was crying. She was actually crying. Her uncle was standing behind her, like holding her chair in the back. Yeah, had an eerie feeling. I didn't see her leaving with uh, anybody when she walked away. Like, I, I thought I heard something. Alberta got into the truck. And then another guy got into the truck, and one guy went to the back. Did you recognize the, the men she was with? No, no, I don't think I... Did she, I she seemed that okay? That like, did, did you notice anything about the way she was, was acting? She looked comfortable, like, like she was comfortable going in the vehicle. We talked to her sister, Claudia, who says she thinks about that night over and over again. Alberta said, come with us, come with us, we're going to a party. And then... You know, I just looked and I said a couple of words to my boyfriend. I turned around. In that sort of time, she was gone. Gone. We interviewed two of the investigators in Alberta's homicide case. Despite never being able to lay charges, they both believe she was killed by her Uncle Jack. Everything kept coming back to that person. And, and you still had questions, but... We still had lots of questions, but... In terms of that one specific person, very few answers. Big list of questions, answers, almost zero. You know, which again, just because it raised a lot of red flags, and that wasn't only my opinion. I've talked with other investigators about it, and everybody pretty much shares the same view, yeah. There was one guy that was always a prime suspect, and you probably know who that is, and that was uh, her relative. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's still the prime suspect today, from what I can learn. We had unprecedented access to police notebooks in an open investigation. We were able to piece together details of their investigation into Alberta's disappearance and murder, like this entry from September 7, 1989. 890907, 1618, 140 Crestview, Jack Little Residence. Feels the situation has gone from bad to worse. Feels there may have been an accident. Question number eight. You have to understand that I have a bad memory times three. I just can't think right now. Not able to recall the names of the people he saw. 
along the way, we talked to some of the people in Gary's notebooks, but also to people who had never spoken to police. No, I wasn't injured at all. And, that, and you were staying at Jack's house that summer? Yes, I was. Yeah. But I think I seen uh, Kathy. I was in Kathy and uh, Carol, Jack, and the guy I mentioned. And um, who else did I see there? Alberta. Um, Some who said they were too frightened to speak out about what they knew. Were you afraid to go to the police? Yeah. I just had to be quiet. I had to wait until, until they find her. We tried to talk to Alberta's Uncle Jack. Hi, Jack. We just really want a, a couple of minutes. I don't know if you, you can spare a few minutes to chat with us. No, but sorry, I can't. And why are we going to go work, sorry. We really just want to get your side of the story. We're doing this story about Alberta, and we really want to hear from you about her last night. Can you tell us anything about it? Was she at your house? Was she there? But he told us to call his lawyer who said in an email that Jack wouldn't talk to us. Both Gary and Rick said Jack told them that Alberta got into a truck with a mysterious white guy at the end of the night, something they never believed. And although the details differ, we talked to three people who also say they saw Alberta get into a truck and leave the bar with either two or three white guys at the end of the night. The truck was black, it was parked ahead of us. Two guys got in the front with her, one guy got in the back. That's what I know for sure is a fact. We uncovered a scenario that police didn't investigate at the time. That Alberta was seen with her Uncle Jack and her brother-in-law, Ken, in another city the day after she supposedly disappeared. She came by uh, by Amanda's late that evening. It was uh, pouring rain. I remember the pouring rain. Are you sure it was Alberta? Yeah, that was Alberta. And she was with two guys in a black truck? Yes. Jack wouldn't talk to us, and Ken said it didn't happen. Ken also told us that he's been interviewed by police in recent years and had been asked to voluntarily provide his DNA, which he refused. You didn't want to give your DNA? Well, I had nothing to hide, and that's what I told. But unless there was a summons or something, then I didn't want to. Why did the police want to talk to you, did they because say? I was with Kathy, your sister, at the time. Oh, okay. So there was a family involvement. Yeah. So, so the next day, we heard that Jack and Alberta and you were in Terrace. No, 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 no. No, I was... I hadn't seen him since the night before. I worked, you know, 12, 14 hour days driving. I went in Terrace the next day. But despite all of this new information, we still had more questions than answers about Alberta's murder. We'd kept Gary in the loop as things progressed, but now that he's listened to the podcast and heard our interviews and the new information, we wondered, what does he think now? Has anything you've heard changed your mind, or do you still think Jack is responsible? No, nothing has changed my mind at all. In fact, if anything, I mean, I'm just as convinced now as I was the day I had sent on the computer or as I'm sitting here talking to you. I mean, again, even in your interaction with Jack, I mean, the reaction you received was pretty much the same reaction we received 27 years ago. This was his niece went missing. He was the last known person to have been seen with her. And you don't want to cooperate with the police. And like I've said before, I, I really, I don't even like that word cooperate. I mean, just tell us, you know, what you know so we can move the investigation forward. Did you hear anything in the podcast that surprised you? Actually, the podcast I listened to today probably surprised me the most about her being seen in uh, Paris the day after, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it surprised me, but then it's, it's also one of those things, too. I mean, there probably hasn't been a police investigation in the last hundred years where the police know absolutely everything. I mean, there are always going to be witnesses that, for whatever reason, don't want to speak to the police. That's where it's good to have a fresh set of eyes. Become so immersed in an investigation that it's tiring, like, long hours. You know, it, 
takes a toll on you. And not to sound silly, but there's other investigations that you're attending to. Like sometimes you've maybe got, you know, half a dozen homicide files on the go at the same time. I, mean, I, I would love nothing better than to sit down with the actual file and go through it again and read it. Gary knows that's not going to happen. Not only because he's retired now, but because he did something police officers rarely, if ever, do. He talked about an unsolved, open investigation, and he's gotten some flack for it from his former colleagues. The one question I've been asked a lot is, like, why would I do this? Like, why would I? And like I said there before, I mean, the reason I did it is I believe it was the right thing to do, and that's why I did it. But in terms of some people have questioned do you feel it's not a betrayal of your time in the RCMP? And again, I don't believe it is. It is almost three decades old. Uh, from what I knew, there was uh, no active investigation. Like right from the first time I had hit send on the computer and I sent you those six words or whatever it was, is again, my hope right at that time and still is, is that uh, you know somebody will be charged at some point and you know, brought to justice. I, d- I certainly don't believe I've done anything wrong stand by what I did. I'm glad that Gary doesn't regret his role in this podcast. I'll admit that I worried about that. But my biggest concerns throughout the past seven or eight weeks have been about Alberta's family. With all of the twists and turns, at times it's felt like we've been on an emotional roller coaster, something that can't be easy on them. What has it been like for them to speak out? to hear people talk about Alberta, or what they saw, to listen to each new development, and to be reminded of the loss of such a beloved sister. Well, for the family, I would say that my brother is my strength. We share everything on the podcast. Everybody chooses how to handle things, how to handle Alberta's murder. Some of my family has chosen, you know, it's too hard for them to handle. That's their own choice. But for me, as an older sister, with my parents not being here anymore, it is not a choice for me. It's an obligation. I have to do something. My parents brought me up to who I am today. And being with Alberta that night, I cannot not do anything or say anything at all. You have to speak out. I have to speak out. And I'm really glad my brother is supportive. And I told him, I said, you know what? I am so happy finally you're on this. I felt so alone. I had nobody there. Had nobody. Being with Alberta that night and within feet from her, if I didn't turn my head, she would be here today. What do you mean, Claudia, when you said that you felt so alone and and that you had nobody? Was this something that your family talked about before the podcast? No, it's just I hold a lot of responsibility in the family. I have younger sisters. There's three of us, three younger sisters. My parents brought me Kathy Williams is one of her sisters. She was the one who didn't want to talk to us at first. Talking about Alberta's murder was too painful for her. Oh, yeah, it is very devastating, especially for my parents and us. Well, now that it's uh, airing online, it just brings back uh, bad bad memories, how, how we lost our sister, Alberta. Do you wish almost that we, we hadn't done this, that we, we didn't bring, bring up these memories? No, no. I think this is probably better. You know, it hurts. Like I said, it reminds us that we lost our sister in a bad way, you know taken away from us. But I think this is good, you know. I'm really hoping that we get justice for my sister and closure for our family. Yeah, the more and more I listen to those podcasts, the more I get involved in it. It's heart-wrenching, but at the same time, it's, it's really intense, and I find it really interesting now. Francis Williams is one of Alberta's brothers. He lives in Gittinyau. He says listening to the podcasts have been difficult, but he's glad to finally be getting some information about Alberta's murder. Say five years ago when there was absolutely nothing, we didn't hear anything from any RCMP or nothing. 
I know they keep saying that uh, even though it's unsolved, it's still an active case. But five years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, nobody even contacted our family. And my mom and dad are both gone now. And then, and still no contact from any RCMP saying that it's still active or what they're doing about anything, if anything, whether it's still sitting in the back of a file somewhere, I don't know. All of Alberta's siblings talked about their parents, Rena and Lawrence Williams, how hard Alberta's murder was on them, and how they wished they would have gotten justice before their deaths. Alberta's sister Karen told us about one night after Alberta's disappearance, when her father decided to take matters into his own hands. The audio quality of this call is not great, so I'll stop and repeat some of the stuff that's hard to hear. At one point, uh, my mom hollered up to me upstairs that my dad was so mad that he went, and we, they have this, they have a gun on every boat, and whatever, she had a, she had a gun. If you miss that, Karen says that one night, her dad was so angry and frustrated about Alberta's disappearance, he got the gun from his fishing boat. We jumped in the car. I remember my, my mom screaming, Dad, Dad, don't do it, don't do it. And I came running down the stairs from the living area upstairs to him. I said, Dad's trying to get into the vehicle with the gun. Karen said her dad took the gun and got into his vehicle. He goes, I'm not going to get no answers from that son of a bitch. I'm going to go get some answers. And I'd say, Dad, Dad, don't, I said. And I'm trying to stop him, and my brother's trying to stop him. And he just shoves us out of the way and gets in his vehicle. And he spins off on the camera all lane, going up to Rosie and Jack's house. He was going to Jack's house? Yes. Yeah. He said, I'm going to get some answers from that son of a bitch, he said. So we waited on pins and needles. He came back, came back in tears. And he sat on the table and he poured it on the glass and he started crying. Mom, well, I couldn't do it, he said. I think he says Alberta spirit stopped him and said, no, Dad, it's not the answer. So I guess he drove up there, sat outside, and then he came to the conclusion, no, this is not going to be answers. As much angry as he was, he came back and he had himself a good, a good cry and then, you know, went to sleep. Francis lived a few houses down from his parents in Prince Rupert. He remembers the turmoil after Alberta disappeared. It was chaos. My dad kind of held himself together, but my mom was just torn apart, and then she turned to drinking after, and then she was just crying and crying. Lawrence and Rena's grief was no doubt compounded because this was not the first daughter they lost. Alberta had another sister named Pam. And about seven years before Alberta's murder, Pam was killed while walking home from a dance in Hazleton, British Columbia. you got to understand that was her second child that she lost. One got killed by a drunk driver in Hazleton in 1983, I think it was. And for her to lose another child, that was really, that really ripped her apart. How old was Pam when she died? She was fairly young too, right, right around Alberta. A group of her and her friends were at a dance there, and then they ended up walking along on the highway there, and the drunk driver came along and just ran her right over. The driver didn't stop after he hit Pam. He kept going, but eventually he was arrested and charged. The person that hit him on her, he got few months in jail and they gave my mom a two thousand dollar check retribution or something like that. Whatever. My mom was broken shell from that already, so she was already numb from the first step. That kind of loss is unimaginable. But it's important to acknowledge that Alberta's family is not alone in their tragedy. Indigenous people in Canada see it live it and fight it every single day. It's a truth that Indigenous women are disproportionately victims of violence, that 76% of kids on reserve in the province of Manitoba live in poverty, that kids on reserves across the country get less money for education, that despite making up less than 5% of the population, 
nearly half of the kids in care in Canada are Indigenous. In fact, there are more Indigenous kids in the child welfare system in Canada today than at the height of residential schools. Indigenous people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, our infant mortality rate is higher, our life expectancy is lower. These are all things that came up during the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And when he delivered his final report, Justice Murray Sinclair said that the story of residential school is really the story of the resilience of children. It's a story about surviving. It's so important to highlight the incredible resilience of Indigenous families and communities that in spite of the adversity, somehow, families like Alberta's have found the strength to fight for justice for their loved ones, to push police forces, push governments, and push the media to pay attention. Now these stories have made it into the spotlight, but no doubt it has not been easy. I asked Claudia where her resilience comes from. It's easy to numb the pain rather than deal with it. I can't sleep at night, you know. I light my shades, I smudge, I light a candle for Alberta. Those are my coping skills. Well, I hope that, you know, you and your siblings have the support you need and that you can support each other as well. I think it'll come together. You know, it's just, you know, for me, it's like, give them time. But then again, it's the shoes that I feel. My mom's not here. They brought me up to who I am. And I wouldn't turn my family away. Through all of this, it's going to bring everybody closer. With this, you know, closure on Alberta, it's going to draw the family together. Because I remind them all the time. I said, you know what? I said, we have each other's. All we got. Despite everything, I said, we have each other's. I said, we stuck with each other's. Now we don't have mom and dad, and we're still going to stick with each other's. Thick and thin, we're still together. Mom and dad, grandpa, and they never left us. They're still with us. Strength is from my parents and my grandfather. Claudia told us that a few weeks after the podcast was released, she got a message from the RCMP and a request to meet with them. Yeah, Wayne Carey came by from the RCMP yesterday, came and he brought with him Sergeant Ron Palka, I think it was. So how did that meeting go? It went well. Wayne Clary works with EPANA, which is a special RCMP task force investigating 18 of the unsolved cases along the Highway of Tears. How many times have you talked to him over the years? This year, I probably talked to him about three times now. So it was only after the media that he started keeping in touch. And I even mentioned that yesterday. And I said, well, you know what? That's really great. I said, that you come here to see me? And I asked him, I said, have you been watching the podcast? He said, yes, I have. And I said, oh, and I said, what do you think? He said, I think they've done an excellent job. And he said, well, he says, out of all my cases, Alberta is top on the list right now. What was your reaction to that? I don't know. I kind of believe him. You know, I said, rather than you coming to me, asking me, okay, well, what do you know? What can you share with me? I said, it should be the other way around. I should be asking you, what's new? How close are we? What have we found out? Aside from you telling me, okay, you watch a podcast. And I asked the RCMP, and I said, look at it, and I said, you know, I want to know exactly how much time are you spending on Alberta's case? How do you evaluate how much time you're going to spend on each case? I know you have a big job. I said, you know, so many missing, murdered women out there. And that's when he brought back again. He says, well, Alberta's case is on top of the list now. And I said, yeah. And I said, well, why, why wasn't that the top of the list before? I said, it's not like Alberta went on the highway, I said, by herself. She didn't go on a highway. She was involved with people, and we knew the people. 
So why, why is it that, you know, all of a sudden she's on top of the list? We had questions for Wayne Clary as well. We had talked to him briefly over the summer about Alberta's case, but he asked that our entire conversation be off the record. Given his earlier hesitation, we were surprised when he eventually agreed to talk to us. Okay, well, thanks very much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Yeah, so just so you know, I really can't talk, uh, uh, you know, very much at all about Alberta's case. So, I, you know, that's kind of the way it is. And I think you know that with, you know, active investigation. So we'll see where we go. I think probably most people will have an idea. But can you kind of explain to us what EPANA is and, and why it was started? Like, I will say that along Highway 16, investigators, you know, over the years, and as recently as, I believe, the early 2000s, you know, they were aware of these cases, unsolved, and the potential for linkages. And they established a criteria which included, you know, female victim, and we'll call it high-risk behavior, um, even though I think some weren't necessarily, necessarily uh, high-risk behavior, which... I would put Monica Jack in that category, a young girl riding her bike in front of her home. But anyway, she and was... Alberta Williams. Y- yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and um, But, uh, you know, they were looking for a serial killer or killers. So that was sort of their goal. So they settled on the 18 that we have. And, uh, and of course, all of these at the outset appeared to be a stranger attack. And, and away we went. So just in general, when you're investigating these um, historical unsolved cases, how common is it to ask people to provide DNA samples? Well, of course, um, you know, it depends what what one has at crime scene. And um, uh, however, we can look individually at one case and have a a person of interest, but uh, potentially... The way we, we often view it is uh, if a person of interest could be identified to other cases. So even though there may or may not be DNA identified from a particular crime scene, we could identify a person of interest, and if we obtain that person's DNA, they could hit another crime scene, um, you know, perhaps not a murder, perhaps a sexual assault, but it sort of gives us a better picture of where that person should fit in the puzzle or where that person may fit in the puzzle. Interesting. So, I mean, what would it say to you if, if you asked someone and they refused to provide their DNA? Well, it could say a lot of things. I, I can tell you most people do. Um, uh, some people don't just because we're the police and um, they don't like us or they don't want to cooperate with us. But if we feel that we need to get it, we'll, we'll get it with other means. How does your unit decide how and when to retest evidence, in, in, I guess specifically in, in some of these EPANA cases, some of which are very old? Well, we have a, a scientist at our lab. That is her job, is our file. And we're well aware of the advances that go on, you know, year to year, and so is she. You know, we work together in, in looking at crime scene and uh and the advances are amazing. So we're well aware of that, and, and we know we have to go back, and, and we do that in conjunction with our, our lab people. If police found bloody clothes and bagged them and put them in an exhibit bag 27 years ago, um, but it was determined that they weren't related to a homicide investigation, an ongoing homicide inve- investigation, what would happen to that evidence? Would it still be somewhere, or would it have been destroyed? It, it, it depends. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, on a major investigation such as a homicide, um, evidence that is gathered, what, it doesn't really matter what it is, it needs to be kept uh, pending um, uh, court proceedings because we all know that uh, you know what the police gather is subject to disclosure. Uh, so it, we have to be very, very careful uh, when we discard any kind of evidence but would that apply to something that had been ruled out as, as not having anything to do with the, with the homicide investigation? I, it very well could, and, and uh, it very well could, yes. So police, I know, have asked uh, taxi drivers in Prince George um, to provide their DNA. Uh, is that something that EPANA has considered asking other uh, taxi drivers in other cities to do? Well, 
Uh, I think this is a bit public, and there's a file that was worked on a Prince George, and I think it might even hit the media that we were, you know, we were hounding all the taxi drivers, uh, um, not only for their their activities on perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the time around the incident, but yeah, uh, we would collect their DNA for sure. In Prince Rupert, is that something that that has been considered? Well, I couldn't say specific, and and, and uh, clearly uh, Alberta is a Prince Rupert case, but it's 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 looked at in all cases where where it's uh, appropriate. I asked Clary about taxi drivers providing DNA, in part because of our conversation with Ken Collinson. We actually phoned Ken's boss at Skeena Taxi in Prince Rupert. His name is Bill Langthorne, and like Ken, he worked for the company back in 1989. I wanted to know if police had ever interviewed any of his drivers or asked for their DNA in connection with Alberta's murder. Do you remember anything about what the police asked for in relation to Ken? They may have questioned him. He still drives here. They didn't ask us, but they may have talked to him because he was with a woman at the time who was related to this Williams girl. Have police ever asked any of your drivers for DNA or to do any kind of lie detector tests in relation to any of those disappearances? I'm pretty sure in the mid-80s or early 90s, we recommended that they should take DNA of every, anybody over 60 because it's been going on all my life and I'm 74. What was the reaction to that? Good idea. So you thought they should take DNA from, from anyone over 60, including cab drivers? Anybody who will volunteer. I mean, I guess, I don't know if you can order it, but that was my first impression. For God's sake, get DNA. So someday these things for families can be resolved, hopefully. And you thought they should take DNA from cab drivers as well? I told the police officer investigating at the time that I would bet 100% of our drivers would offer DNA. Freely. Bill was surprised when we told him that Ken Collinson had already been asked for his DNA and refused to give it. So when we, when we talked to Ken, he told us that the RCMP did ask for his DNA and that he didn't want to give it. That doesn't, well, I wasn't privy to any of that information, but that surprises me. Yeah, he said that he said that because they already have his his fingerprints on file that that should be, you know, that should be enough. Uh, well, yeah, they, they're, all cab drivers have fingerprints on file. But we're just wondering like why would they have asked him and and if if you know that they've ever asked any other cab drivers who work for Skeena Taxi for their DNA. All I know is what I asked told the RCMP what I previously stated, they should ask everybody, cab drivers included, 60 or older, to provide voluntarily DNA. As we were talking to Bill, another cab driver walked into his office. I'm sorry, I was just reading a note. One of the drivers who worked for the company at that time left me a note while you were talking to me. Oh, really? What did he say? The driver who, who was working for us in those days, also works for us now, mm -hmm. left me this handwritten note because I was talking to you. Ken, uh, Ken, he's referring to, was drinking at that party that night. He was there at 549 Cassiar that night. Alberta's uncle was a serious suspect. Ken wouldn't hurt a butterfly. Volunteer statement, if you want it, run. So the guy that handed you the note, um, I'm curious... This Hey, I'm okay. I, I gave the report of this one. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll keep that. Yeah, okay. yeah. And um, I was. Uh, Sorry about that. I was oh, just no, talking I, to Ron that I, left me this note. Other than that, I did have a liquor delivery that night, and he was there with his girlfriend, Kathy, which was Alberta's older sister, and they were all. I knew drunk. there was a relationship. They were all drunk. Where was so it? You Where had was a liquor delivery that night, too. Yeah, two well, that. 10, to, 10 to 11, I think. Sorry, so can Ron know. come closer to the phone? Because we can barely hear him. I, it's, I'd really like to hear what he's saying. So where, where did you say you had a liquor, liquor delivery? Uh, there was a, they were at 549 Cassian, and I believe it was apartment, I think it was 201 or 202 that night. They were all there. Uh, 
drinking. I delivered uh, booze, cigarettes. Uh, Ken was there drinking. He was already off shift. He was drinking with his girlfriend, Kathy, who happens to be Alberta's sister. And I remember that uh, morning when I actually, or that afternoon, uh, Ken told me he was crying on the phone. He goes, you heard? I said, heard what? I heard something. I, I can't remember what it was. It was a couple days after. It wasn't, wasn't that next day. And he told me, I said, did you hear anything? And then we, then the family was talking about that their Kathy and uh, Alberta's uncle was being uh, looked at real carefully. And they still think today, the family still thinks today that it was their uncle, but they had no proof, right? So you said you heard Ken was out crying on the phone? Oh, yeah, like about three, I found about about three days later or four days later, I guess, after they had found Alberta's body there. Me and Ken have been close friends probably a good 30 years. He has grandkids. He wouldn't even hurt a butterfly, that guy. He's the most honest, nicest guy out there, actually. And when you said that they were all drinking at that party, did you see, was was anyone else at that party? Was Alberta there as well? Oh, yeah, Alberta was there. Kathy, her older sister was there. Ken was there. And there's two or three other uh, guys there. Uh, one of them was their uncle. There's a couple other guys there, right? So... And Kathy would definitely know who was there because that's Alberta's sister. She would know exactly who was there that night. You can still see her hurt and pain of not knowing who, you know, who did it and or whatever. But it's disturbing the fact that, you know, it's so close home and you know someone like that. It's just like, wow. Yeah. The people you saw at the party were Alberta, her sister Kathy, Ken, and Jack. And then other, like two or three, maybe three other people there that were drinking. I think there was a couple males, and then there was another lady there. I'm not 100% sure, but I remember there was a group of about seven, maybe eight people there. And this was at an apartment on... Yeah, 549 Cass here. And the, fall, the following whatever day or a couple of days after this. And do you remember if this was on the Friday night or if it was on the Saturday? I'm pretty sure it was on a Friday night. It was Saturday morning. Yeah, Saturday morning was, yeah, Saturday morning. Because I delivered it Friday. I'm pretty sure the booze that night was a Friday night, and then Saturday, uh, you know, obviously it happened sometime in the early wee hours. And So do you have any idea whose apartment this was? Uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Kathy and Ken's place, because I remember them, they were staying up at 549 Cass here. Mm. So did I think it was the second floor I, when I delivered it. It's so many years ago, you know, it's just... But I do remember... Actually, I, myself, because I went to the liquor delivery, I told the RCMP, and I actually got questioned, gave them the same statement, and the same words that I'm giving you, actually. Did RCMP ever ask for you to take a lie detector test or ask for your DNA in any case? Uh, no, no, they didn't ask because there were was, there was so many, but I, I told them if you want to volunteer, I said no problem at all, not at all. Ron said he saw Ken at an apartment with Jack and Alberta after they left the bar that Friday night. Ken told us he didn't see Jack or Alberta at all that night. Is it possible they went to the apartment either before or after the party at Jack's house? We tried to find out if Ron's recollection was accurate. So we checked with Kathy. She said she and Ken lived at a place called Digby Towers, not on Cassier Avenue. This made me wonder what other details Ron might have mistaken. We're still trying to figure out how his eyewitness account squares with everything else we've learned, and how, or if, it fits in the timeline of Alberta's disappearance and murder. Now, back to our conversation with the RCMP's Wayne Clary. Can you tell us how much of a priority Alberta's case is right now? Well, I, I would say it's very active right now, along with uh, with some others, for sure. And I can say that because of the podcast, it's, you know, we're getting information, and I've been working closely with Claudia, as uh, I'm sure you know well, and uh, she's been receiving information and and, and passing it over to me and uh, act on it accordingly. So you're getting information uh, relating to Alberta's unsolved murder since our podcast has started airing? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's to me, that's what it's all about. That's why the media can be so helpful in these old cases. I think there's something out there, uh, and we just need something from somebody or from a group of people with information to help us move forward. And just help, help us understand, what does an open or active investigation mean when a case is 27 years old, for example? Well, um, of course, these unsolved cases or older cases, they're tough. 
um, and in particular the Padawans, because like I said, they were stranger to stranger. Um, mostly they're done in isolation. Um, mostly they're done just with the victim and the, and the perpetrator. Um, and, and you know, I, I will use the analogy, if, if you don't shake the tree, nothing will fall out. And so what we've done in Ipana is we've, we've looked at all the work that's been done. Uh, we've decided what needs to be redone. Um, we've interviewed many, many, many more people outside of the initial investigations. And, and from there, they lead to further, you know, further interviews or further lines of inquiry. And, uh, you know, we kind of go from there. And it it's just takes hard work, and, and we hope for a break. Is there a DNA profile in Alberta's case that we could... That's commit? something, Connie, I can't talk about. Uh, you know, because then, I, then I'd go back about talking about the investigation, and, 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 and clearly that, uh, uh, that would be a significant part of it, and I can't, uh, can't really get there. So. How are you changing the way that you interact with family members? of missing and murdered Indigenous women, especially, you know, the cases that are still unsolved after many years? We're well aware of this in the RCMP. And um, uh, three or four years ago, then, uh, the officer in charge of major crime throughout the division, we actually initiated policy where we would set um, uh, guidelines about contacting with the family and, 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 and timetables and who the family contacts are, and and, and we would sort of set a table that would be um, suitable for whatever family member we were involved with. And that's kind of where we're at today. And that was done to try to to respond to some of the concerns of, of families? or what was... yeah, I, I think so, you know, I, and, I, and uh, like we're aware of it, uh, that, you know, in the past, uh, I think uh, work was done, but... Um, Probably communication wasn't probably what it should have been, and and you know I've, I've said this before, but you know um, excellence in policing is uh, is a process, not an event. And now we've we we moved to this area, and and it's a good place to be, and it's the right thing to do. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, you mentioned kind of coming up with the EPANA criteria um, for for the cases that were included, and you said I think a couple of times stranger to stranger. Um, why was that? Can you t- talk a bit about why that was part of the criteria? And and I know that you can't speak to Alberta's case specifically, but well, that would um, most murders serve occur um, the victim and the murderer are known to each other. That's by and large. That's the case. Um, so, I, I guess sort of we were looking for a serial killer, and it was bandied about in the media, um, and and we were very well aware that that could have been the case. And so the, those are the, those are the hard ones. Um, uh, and essentially, it is a stranger to stranger situation. So. Um, I just have to say, I mean, given what we've heard from Gary, that that seems a bit odd then to have included Alberta's case in, in there, considering it seemed the RCMP had a, a strong suspect or strongly suspected a family member. Well, once again, I can't talk on that case, um, uh, but I suppose um, it was identified to us through the investigation. I'm sure you're aware as well that there's been a, a male identified that's uh, you know that's been involved. Uh, with Alberta um, the night she left the uh, the bar but uh, you know I can't really say much more than that uh, and I, you know what I wasn't involved picking these cases uh, but they settled on this and I can tell you that when I came over to Epana in 2012 I was curious as to why they picked the 18 or settled on the 18 they did so I had one of our investigators you know provide me with a list of uh, the other files they looked at, and I think there's 57 other homicides they actually looked at. I, I just wanted that for my own satisfaction. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uns- all unsolved. Yeah. Wow. A, a lot of our sort of EPAN investigations, we get what we call general persons of interest, and I can tell you these are bad men. Um, so we look at, you know, where they live, where they travel, you know, what's the record. There's a lot. There's, the public doesn't realize that how many men are out there that hurt women. It's uh, really quite amazing. 
and uh, so that's kept us busy, and um, and then we keep working that way. We've been talking about the podcast, and that's obviously why we're calling. Um, have you been listening to the podcast? Yes. What are your thoughts so far? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's it's put the case out in the in the public uh, once again. I think that's all positive because it's it's all good. What do you think about a former RCMP officer speaking out in this way? Personally, um, I think he would have got more satisfaction if he called uh, our investigation. I'm thinking he should have been aware that Alberta Williams' case was included in Project Cupana, and, and, you know, I'll just leave it at that. But uh, clearly he cared, and I sure can't take that away from him because um, I can think of some of the cases that I still care about. Why did those ones stick with you? Well, because we like to solve things. Do you think that Alberta's murder can still be solved? Absolutely. I think it can all be solved. It takes it takes work and it takes that break. It's going to take the right piece of information coming to the police. And then we go from there. I, I strongly believe it's there in all the cases. Uh, we just need to get it because we know how to do our business, and frankly, we, I think we do it very well, uh, and we want to solve these cases. We really do. My name is Kona Williams, and I am a forensic pathologist at the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service in Toronto, and um, I am First Nations. I'm Korean Mohawk. Kona is no relation to Alberta. She's Canada's first Indigenous forensic pathologist and has worked on some MMIW cases. Since Wayne wouldn't tell us, we wanted to get her expert analysis about the likelihood that there is DNA in Alberta's police file. What's your assessment on, on whether or not there might be viable DNA from Alberta's file? From what I did read, it looked as though some swabs and some samples were taken. And I know that that was quite a number of years ago, back in 1989, I believe, um, but as long as whatever the samples were, uh, were stored appropriately. So if they're stored in a dry environment, uh, under moderately or cool, moderately cool or cool temperatures, then without any heat, um, then it, whatever's there, if there's something, if there's DNA available, then it's possible that uh, it would have been very stable over time. If there's DNA available, it might have degraded somewhat. Um, but if there was something there, a, a positive profile is possible. So we know that Alberta's body wasn't found for a few weeks. I think it was three weeks after she she disappeared, and that it was a bit of um, a boggy area. So so there there was some water. I think that she was submerged in. Could that have affected any possible DNA that police would have been able to to take? Uh, yeah, it's it's possible. Um, you know, the, the, the decompositional process uh, is different for everybody. Um, and again, depending on the environmental conditions and how decomposed her body was, uh, it, it I mean, the, the chances are there that there could still be some viable samples, but it would make it a little bit more difficult. It would make it more difficult to to collect or to ensure that they were maintained? The longer somebody is, the longer they've been dead, the further along the decompositional process has gone, it can affect uh, the samples, unfortunately. In 1989, Gary traveled to Vancouver for Alberta's autopsy. The purpose of me being there was obviously as one of the investigators and to seize any exhibits. And exhibits could be anything from clothing to blood samples to you know, maybe samples of a liver, or samples of a heart, samples of skin. Obviously, the pathologist does their autopsy, which I was present for. And then I seized all of the exhibits, again, which did include some clothing. So once I got back to Prince Rupert, then I've got all the exhibits. The exhibits are cataloged. If they're wet, they're dried. And any exhibits, say, for example, a piece of clothing would have been kept in Prince Rupert once it was properly dried and properly bagged and properly stored. And then there's other exhibits, you know, whether it was clothing may have also gone down to the lab to see whether there was any forensic evidence on them. So Gary took some efforts to ensure that the evidence he collected from Alberta was stored properly. 
but I'm sure the procedures have changed a lot in 27 years. Could there still be a DNA sample? Typical police storage is usually pretty stable. So as long as they were kept under those conditions, again, the possibility is still there that there could be viable samples. So it's not unheard of to have samples that were collected in 1989 that still contain DNA? It is possible. And it's no, it's not unheard of. If police had tested, say, five years ago, um, those swabs from Alberta's case for DNA and weren't able to find anything, is it possible that they could find DNA now, five years later? Um, well, again, like the, the technology is moving. It's, it's advancing very quickly. Um, and the main changes are in sensitivity. And so way back when, you'd need a lot of, uh, you know, whatever fluid it was or, um, you know, whatever sample you'd need, such as blood. Um, but now you just need very, very small amounts. It, it is possible that there, you know, the technology now might be more sensitive. But again, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's probably evident by now that although this is our last episode, our investigation is not going to be tied up in a nice bow. We may never find out who killed Alberta Williams. And as much as I was hoping to find out the truth, this story has become about more than Alberta. It's also about all of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls with their own stories and their own families search for justice. It's about the impact of residential schools echoing through generations of families and communities. Leaving with more questions than answers is not the way we want it to end, but we hope that at least asking the questions and telling part of Alberta's story was the right thing to do. I think it's worth it. It's not such a secret anymore. The book is open. The book is open. You, you, do you feel like you're closer well, to finding out the truth? I believe we're closer to getting the truth. I believe it's going to be solved. There's just so much out there. People who were hiding behind the walls before are no longer hiding behind the walls. There is nowhere to go. Missing and Murdered, Who Killed Alberta Williams is written and hosted by me, Connie Walker. The producer is Marnie Luke, and the associate producer is Lori Ward. Technical production by Ashley Walters, Cecil Fernandez, and Harold Dupuy. Heather Evans is the senior producer of the CBC News Investigative Unit. Thank you for listening to Missing and Murdered, Who Killed Alberta Williams. If you're looking for more true crime podcasts, Check out Someone Knows Something, another CBC original. Journalist David Ridgen investigates the 1997 disappearance of Cheryl Shepard. And to hear more about Dr. Kona Williams and her work investigating cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, listen to CBC's Campus Podcast. To learn more about both, visit cbc.ca slash podcasts or subscribe in iTunes or your favourite podcast app. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.